Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing fabulously well. And I hope that the weather is warming up where you are in your part of the world. Let me know how the weather is where you are and whether you're feeling a bit warmer now, whether the spring is on the horizon and we're about to welcome in warmer days. Let me know what it's like where you are. And don't forget to get that wonderful effervescent sparkling drink or a lovely hot cup of cocoa. And before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up and let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, It was in the early 60s and at 10 years old, my best friend Marty lived in the neighbouring farm to ours. We hung around together all the time. We were as thick as thieves in those days, like brothers to each other. When I reminisce over my childhood, all my wistfully nostalgic memories invariably always involve Marty. It would seem that in my family, I was the unheralded, serendipitous, unplanned surprise that no one could have forecast arriving on the scene so late in the day. Somehow I had tenaciously subjugated the odds of defeating my mother's fastidious birth control regimes, rendering her pregnant. By the time I was born, all four of my older sisters had successfully graduated from college. They were no longer living at home. So for me, they were more like aunts than sisters, as the age gap between us was quite substantial. In a nutshell, you could describe me as an only child, who was really favoured, cherished and beloved by my father. But I hasten to say he never bought me a coat of many colours, like Joseph in the Bible, which would have been rather nice. But there you go, you can't have everything. Suffice to say, my dad, as he'd always yearned for a son, had given up on the expedient ambition of ever siring one. He believed his sperm was genetically predisposed to producing exclusively female offspring, which would have been exceedingly useful if my mother had been a cow and my father had owned a dairy herd, which he didn't, of course. Jokes aside, in truth he believed his sperm was firing off female 2X chromosomes on all cylinders, as his older brother Montgomery had raised 14 children, of which none had been boys. What were the odds of that happening? When my mother was pregnant with me, they automatically assumed I was yet another girl on the way. Indeed, they were so confident about this fact that my mother had already knitted pink clothes for me, and at her hen party, all her girlfriends had given her pink gifts. She had decided upon a name for me. I was to be called Rosalind Holmes. When I was born, that's after a great deal of kicking and screaming, I took quite a lot of time leaving the safe confines of my mother's dark, cosy womb and entering upon this world. The nurse said, Congratulations on your baby, Mr. Holmes, to my father. It's a boy. As she came out of the hospital room to usher him in, to my mother's room, who was sitting up in bed, holding me in a pink blanket and brightly smiling at my father. Can you believe it? she says to him. Your wish has come true. We've had a boy. My father thought there was a grievous mistake. I mean, there had to be. I mean, his whole family line only ever produced female offspring, did they not? But when he checked my anatomy, he realised I was indeed a boy. He began to dance around the hospital ward jubilantly, singing at the top of his voice. He was so thrilled. Everywhere he went, he told everybody, I've had a boy. I have had a boy. It was a miracle of note. At least my father thought it was. He was convinced the prayer request that he had placed in a tiny crack in the wailing wall in Israel had finally come to fruition, even if God had taken a hell of a long time to finally answer it. My mother told me never ever to tell my sisters about my father's rapturous delight that he had exhibited that day, as she didn't want my sisters to feel less appreciated by him. It must have taken my parents two weeks to finally agree on a name for me. In the end, it was decided that I would be called Cameron Fergus Holmes, as I came from a strong Scottish lineage in my distant family roots on my father's side, a heritage he carried with a measure of pride. One beautiful morning in early spring, in western Kentucky, when the Japanese magnolias, the eastern budwoods, dogwoods and cherry trees were extravagantly in blossom, which me and my friend Marty called confetti trees, 
as they were covered in a plethora of pretty blooms, and the moment they burst forth with blossom, we absolutely knew that spring had arrived, for this was to us the quintessential first sign that winter was finally behind us. We had so much to look forward to. It would mean that this year's corn would soon be planted, and that the sunny weather was going to return, which is something we eagerly embraced, especially in spring, which is quite simply the best time of the year here as the temperature is quite literally perfect, neither too hot nor too cold. Regretfully, late summer in Kentucky can sometimes be hot and muggy. If me and Marty were birds, we would definitely have serenaded and embraced the arrival of spring with joyful twitters. But given we were both tone deaf and couldn't sing at all, it was good that we didn't open our mouths at all, I hasten to say. We could explore the countryside more in spring than any other time of year, rough it on our mountain bikes, climb trees with the weather being a congenial friend, rather than harassing us with frequent bouts of inconvenient, annoyingly biting, hostile, cold, wet weather. I remember my mother used to hate me coming indoors, after I'd been running around the farm in winter. There was so much mud everywhere. I don't even know where it all came from. It seemed I had this masterful way of plastering the place with mud. It would invariably end up in the most obscure places, like the side of the sofa, on the edge of the refrigerator, or in my father's sock drawer, which would drive my house-proud mother completely dilly. For goodness sake, Cameron, she would say, how many times have I told you to leave your muddy boots in the entrance hall? Why don't you ever learn? If we got thick snow during November, our farm would become an adventure playground for us where me and Marty would go tobogganing, snowshoeing and snowball fighting together, which was loads of fun for two ten-year-old boys. We also always made a massive snowman, using my father's bowler hat and a candy-striped scarf that had once belonged to my grandfather. I grew up in an old, very dignified-looking whitewashed farmhouse with huge French windows, duck-egg blue shutters and a grey slate roof. It was a kind of congenial, warm home, dribbling with character, oozing with charm, and seeping with humour. I believe our house did have a sense of humour, for sometimes it would seem to be laughing with us, as it was a place that had contained and harboured the laughter of generations of our family before us. I was to learn when my grandfather was alive. His booming laughter was so loud, it rattled the walls and windows of the house, with his thigh-slapping hoarse laughs that invariably involved lots of snorting. All these years later, long after his death, sometimes for no fathomable reason whatsoever, the house windows would involuntarily rattle and vibrate. Could my grandfather's disembodied laughter still be causing the walls of our home to engage in a belly laugh? It would seem so. Our sumptuous cosy home had remained nestled in the heart of a viridescent valley for over 250 years. It looked like it harmoniously belonged to the natural environment as if it folded seamlessly into the indigenous natural flora and fauna, and when the annual cereal grass of the corn crop bloomed and blossomed, swaying in the wind under a gentle breeze, often with a lone corn-bunting bird seen clinging to the grass, it was certainly a spectacular sight to behold. We always had a scarecrow standing up in the field. My father created it as a perfect imitation of himself, and it was an excellent likeness. There were many times I thought the scarecrow actually was him. He had designed it to be portable so that it could be moved around the fields frequently, so the birds never ever cottoned on to the fact that it wasn't actually my dad. Our symmetrical farmhouse had stood up proud and tall. It demanded your attention. It seemed to sense that it was loved and adored. It possessed a tin roof. I never forget that, as there is nothing to beat the sound of rain pelting down on a tin roof. It's one of the cosiest feelings in the world. Our two-storey farmhouse was a substantial size, overlooking fields, vast fields of corn, from beyond our front yard. My mother kept our home naturally in pristine condition, as she derived a certain amount of pleasurable satisfaction from buffing up the house so it shone like a bright new pin. You'd have to scour our home with a fine tooth comb to find even a drop of dust or a lone cobweb dangling on the corner of a high ceiling. I remember it always smelt of homemade bread and of lily of the valley. The latter was my mother's all-time favourite perfume that seemed to linger all over the house and become one with its natural smell. In my childhood there was one day that protrudes in my mind 
like an elevated ocean wave, leaping and soaring and bounding above all my other memories, so much so that it is indelibly entrenched in my mind, and like a stubborn piece of heavy farm machinery, it simply refuses to budge from my recollections all these fifty years later. For me that morning is as clear and translucent in my mind today as it was all those years ago, almost as if I'm looking through a mirror. I awoke with the pale blue and grey mohair curtains on my window, blowing in a breeze, billowing against the window, as it had been left slightly ajar overnight. A cool breeze blew generously into my room, filled with the sweet scent of magnolia blossom, and the whole room was infused with a soft warm light that appeared brighter than usual. The warmth of the morning sun dappled my blue comforter in a bright golden light. My bedroom in those days had wedgewood blue walls covered with posters of bush planes flying over mountains and glacier lakes in Alaska, and shelves displaying model aircraft, as I was exceedingly zealous about planes in those days, and secretly fancied myself flying my own bushcraft over Alaska some day. Suffice to say, that has never happened, although I did become a car mechanic later on in life, working with all kinds of engines. I trudged over to the window, glancing out of the glass pane. I could see my mother in the backyard with her chestnut flip bob blowing in the wind. She was wearing a pink and purple flowering shift dress with a gingham apron tied around her middle and carrying a bowl of chicken seed in her hand, which she was throwing out generously for the hungry chickens, a mix of Rhode Island Red, Plymouth Rocks, Dominique and Brahma chickens, who were pecking the ground happily. I could see that the sky was so blue, without a white fluffy cloud in sight. The confetti trees in our yard were ablaze with blossom. It was a kind of congenial happy day that had me dashing to my wardrobe to throw on my clothes, a short pants suit with long socks, and my sneakers, as I wanted to be out there, basking under the warm rays of the sunshine, exploring the countryside on the back of my bike with Marty. "'Hi, Mum,' I said, running out of the kitchen door towards the shed, to grab my bike as quickly as I could. "'Sweetheart,' she says to me, "'where are you going? Aren't you going to have some oatcakes for breakfast? You shouldn't start the day on an empty stomach. Even our chickens know better than that.' "'Was she kidding?' I thought. The last thing on my mind was food. Not hungry, I shout, as I quickly climb on my bicycle and ride down our long driveway through the gates, taking a right-hand turn on the precarious dirt road that is strewn heavily with rocks towards Marty's farm. And then I cycle past the rusty open cattle gate with a faded sign that reads Moonlight Ridge towards his father's red barn that is about fifty feet away from the main farmhouse an unremarkable, prosaic-looking, rather deflated, sad, subdued-looking building that has almost certainly seen better days. It seems to be expressing the underlying pessimistic hopelessness of its beleaguered inhabitants. Even the large glass windows of the farmhouse are smeared, as if glass cleaner has not been applied to their surfaces for a remarkably long period of time, while the sagging roof looks like it's crying out for attention. I wouldn't be surprised if it actually leaks. I throw my bicycle up against the barn wall, climbing off my bike, blowing my whistle three times as loudly as I can. I wear it around my neck at all times, attached to a red ribbon. Marty never likes me to go to the back kitchen door when his dad's at home. He knows when he hears the whistle that I'm announcing my arrival on the farm, so we can hang out together. I always get the impression that Marty does not like his dad at all. I've never been invited over to his farmhouse when his dad's around which my mother always says is conspicuously revelatory. She tells me she's seen him around town on several occasions. She'd say, scary-looking man, shifty eyes, thin mean mouth. Do you know I said hello to him once? I'm your next-door neighbour. My son Cameron hangs around with your lovely boy Marty. Can you believe it? He just snorted contemptuously at me, walked off, never so much as even acknowledged me. I mean, how rude is that? Mrs. Thomas, who was talking to me at the time, told me not to take any offence by it, as he's naturally a miserable, cantankerous old sod. I do pity his wife, says my mum. Imagine being married to him. No wonder his wife always looks like a frightened mouse. I invited her over to tea once, and she said, No thanks, I really can't. I'd love to see what goes on in that farmhouse, behind closed doors. I only had ever been inside Marty's family farmhouse a handful of times, when his mother was always present. She was the most quiet, unassuming woman I'd ever met, 
the kind of person that almost apologised for existing, as her self-esteem was possibly the size of an ant's egg, minuscule, microscopic. She always gave me the impression that she'd like to shrink into the shadows like a ghost, for she seemed as sad as the desolate house itself, as if she was carrying the weight of the world upon her shoulders, and was almost crumbling and groaning beneath its heavy weight. She was a thin woman with dark eyes and a fragile body, like a doll, that looked like it could so easily break. I always used to clandestinely think that if she was caught up in a feisty windstorm, she might just get blown over, like a feather. Moments after I'd blown my whistle, Marty comes out of the house. At first he doesn't look directly at me. His brown head of hair is fixed on the ground, as if he's willfully trying to avoid any eye contact with me. Then I see the tall, doleful silhouette of his insolent father. He's standing in the doorway. He's glaring at me, wearing a huge, opprobrious frown on his face. He eyes me objectionately, through indignant, acrimonious, fiery brown eyes. To my horror, he comes marching out of the house, swinging his arms backwards and forwards captiously, as if he wants to strike something down with his fists. I'm quite sure he'd like that to be me. But I'm not his son. He's possibly struggling to contain the explosive fury rising up within him, for his whole face is jiggling with a frustrated angst that he'd like to inject into me like a hornet's sting. He gives the impression of being like a cantankerous transient sea lion, as mad as hell, almost as if he's looking to pick a fight with someone in order to air his grievances, which will make him feel a whole lot better. So it's you again, is it, young man? he says with a loud, sneering roar. Can't keep away, can you? You're like a nasty, bad smell, always reappearing again and again. You keep blowing that god-awful whistle all the time. Are you trying to wake the living dead with all this noise pollution? I'm sorry, sir, I say, flushing. If you want to see my son... Why do you not come and knock on the front door like any normal, respectable kid would do? Instead of blowing that bloody whistle of yours, where did you get it from? He asks me scornfully. My father bought it for me, sir, I explain. He should be bloody ashamed of himself buying you such a noisy, disruptive instrument. What was he thinking? A kid like you with a whistle like that? Given half a chance, you'll be blowing that wretched thing all day long. Ha! Oh, I know what kids like you are like. You just can't help yourself, can you? Thrive on being bloody nuisances day after day after day. You simply can't stop meddling, can you? In my day, children were seen and not heard. But now you kids seem to think you can bloody do whatever the hell you like. Sod the rest of us. That's the attitude nowadays. It makes me bloody sick. It makes my blood boil. Your mother should teach you some manners, young man. But given your mother, oh, I've seen her around town. Nasty woman she is. Sir, uh, so I only ever use the whistle to call Marty. I didn't mean to make a noise. If you like, I won't ever do it again. I, I, I'll come to the kitchen door and, and knock. Marty's father is not listening to me. His eyes are resting on my bike, parked against the barn wall. What the hell are you doing, young man, parking your bicycle against my wall? How dare you be so goddamn presumptuous? This is so bloody typical of the young generation these days. No respect for other people's property. You're scuffing up my wall with those bicycle bars of yours. Did your father not teach you to respect other people's property? I suppose not. After all, he hasn't taught you any manners. You've got dreadful parents, young man. I'm surprised that Mr Butcher... Marty's father cares about his barn at all, given its dishevelled state. Even his mechanic shop on the other side of the property looks like it's a chaotic hodgepodge of stuff. As Marty's unblunted father blasts away venomously at me, I feel quite intimidated by his mordacious energy, and want nothing more than to run away from him as fast as I possibly can. I've never been spoken to like this so ruthlessly, with such an astringent spite.
I can feel tears welling up in the back of my eyes, but I fight them back as hard as I possibly can. I don't want to look like a complete baby. I'm ten years old, for goodness sake. Besides, I don't want to give this sardonic, corrosive man the slightest satisfaction that he's ruffled my feathers. I want him to think that nothing he said to me has upset me in the slightest. So I straighten my back up proudly, look him directly in the eyes and say to him, Have a nice morning, Mr. Butcher. Sorry to have caused you so much grief. He scoffs at me, turns around to retreat back to his house, and under his acidic, treacherous breath, loud enough for us to both hear, he spits out, Bloody kids! They should all be aborted from birth, the whole damn lot of them! He spits on the ground, walks back to the house, slamming the door behind him so hard that I almost jump out of my skin. Phew! All I can say, he's one miserable character. Sorry about my dad, says Marty apologetically, climbing onto his bike. He he's in a bad mood today. Soon we are rigorously cycling back to my farm to get the hell away from Moonlight Ridge. We park our bikes in the shed, waving enthusiastically to my father, who is sitting very happily on the back of his green tractor that is chugging away as it plants the corn seed on long ribbons of neatly tilled fertile soil. He waves at us as we run through the green valley towards the large creek of silvery water that is fringed by a spectacular oak and hickory wood grove that sprawls to the rear of our properties, extending to Marty's father's farm as well. It's when I look up at Marty, I see his black eye. I'm nonplussed. This is the third time in six months he's had a black eye. If that's not enough, he's always covered with perplexing, inexplicable bruises that I secretly suspect have a whole lot to do with his crotchety father, who seems to have about as much patience over children as a brown-headed cowbird has over her younglings. She lacks the tenacity to warm her own eggs, so she lays them in another bird's nest, so she can avoid fledgling care and egg-warming duties. I suppose you walked into a door again, I say sarcastically, as deep down in my gut I know that Marty has been telling me porkies all along. I haven't failed to notice the amount of bruises he's acquired. I've heard every excuse under the sun, from him tripping over the ladder in the barn, falling over the Labrador dog, bumping into a tree, walking through a pane of glass. I've spent enough time with Marty to know that he's not accident-prone when he's around me. On the contrary, he's much more agile than I am. But every time he goes home, it sounds like he's living in a precarious obstacle course and falling all the time. He's always covered in mysterious, ambiguous bruises. Sometimes I've seen him hobbling out of his house in pain, as if he's really been beaten up exceedingly badly. As I previously mentioned, I have my sneaking suspicions that Marty's father is beating him up. But I don't want to make Marty feel uncomfortable by pressing him to tell me about what's really going on with him and his father. But I hasten to say, I do feel rather hurt that he hasn't confided in me, as I consider Marty to be like a brother to me, so we shouldn't be keeping any secrets from each other. I decide to let sleeping dogs lie, allow Marty to confide in me when he desires to do so. I know he's protecting his father's reputation, and honestly I don't know why he bothers. By all accounts, his father has a dreadful reputation in town. He's one of those people that no one has warmed to over the years. Nobody even remotely likes. You only have to look at the man to see he's a disagreeable sort. Marty tries to maintain this misleading charade, to keep up the appearances that he lives a normal life, as deep down he longs for normality like you or I might long for a holiday abroad somewhere. But normality for Marty is a dream on the furthest horizon that is so beyond his reach. I haven't failed to notice the apprehensive reluctance that he exhibits every time he returns home, as if he's desperately trying to summon up the courage to retreat back to the confines of a place that should naturally embody all that is good. It should embody love, warmth, security, safety and comfort but not for him, it would seem. Yeah, he says to me, avoiding eye contact with me. I don't know why I keep walking into that door. As we're ambling towards the creek, we both discover dozens and dozens of tiny, doomed, half-dollar-sized baby turtles, crawling over the darkened earth, moving away from the water in the wrong direction, towards the fields of neatly sown corn. They're climbing on top of each other, appear dry and disorientated, 
Me and Marty naturally want to save their lives, so we gather them up in our shirts, dashing over towards the creek. Granted, when they get bigger in size, they can appear mean, hissing, and rear up at you. Yet these little tenacious turtles seem so vulnerable. We sense they desperately need our help. We can't judge their characters based on some of the snappy, large turtles we've encountered in the past. For one of these little turtles may potentially grow up to be an agreeable, likeable fellow. If the hands of fate smile kindly upon him, that is. And if his life isn't auspiciously expunged from him by many of the predators that he will have to surreptitiously avoid. Sometimes it's good to give nature a helping hand. Well, that's the way I look at it anyway. We walk towards the edge of the pebbly beach, lower their leathery tiny bodies into the water. They're waving their legs indignantly. Their heads are cranked, but the moment they're plunged into the water, they spring back to life, as if the water itself has energised and revitalised their dry bodies. At first they swim erratically, rather like pigeons across the water, and then once they're submerged, they're gone. We don't even get to see their eyes bobbing above the surface. I think they're so grateful to be reacquainted with the water. We sit down on the side of the creek, close to a large patch of cat's tails, their cigar-like brown spikes rising up in the shallow part of the water. Marty places a blade of grass into the side of his mouth. He begins to chew it. You know, I didn't really bump into the door, spouts Marty quite suddenly. My heart begins to thump in my chest excitedly. I can smell that Marty is about to tell me the truth. I've been longing for this moment, when he would finally choose to confide in me, disclose what has been happening behind closed doors in that less-than-congenial home of his. Well, you're not really accident-prone when I'm with you, I admit, so I sense something else was going on. Marty frowns. You mean all this time you knew I was lying? He says, looking disappointed. Why didn't you say anything? I watch him pulling up one of his long socks, by way of distraction. I guess I figured you'd tell me in your own time. It's your father, isn't it? He does this to you. I can see he's a cantankerous bully. Everyone knows it. I hate him, says Marty, taking a blade of grass and chewing it in his mouth. I bloody, bloody hate him. Excuse my language. I wish he was dead. I'm not just saying that. In the heat of the moment, like you probably think I am. I really mean every single word of it. I really wish he was dead. You do? Well, don't apologise to me. I'm on your side. You're like a brother to me, Marty. Besides, I agree with you. The way he laid into me earlier on, he terrified the life out of me. He's got a barbed, vicious tongue on him. I thought some of those big, mean, snapping turtles could be formidable. But your dad... He's a thousand times worse. I think I'd rather swim with one of those big turtles in the creek any day of the week than spend even a night under your roof with your horrible dad. Why does he hurt you? I ask him, my eyes not leaving his face. He's always angry, says Marty. When he drinks, he gets even madder. He beats my mother up a lot. I intervene to stop him hurting my mum. So I get caught up in the crossfire. He lashes out at me. He hurts me instead. You've seen how fragile my mother is. I mean, I can't sit back and do nothing, can I? I have to intercede. I mean, if I don't, he's going to kill her. I know he's going to kill her. It won't take him much to snap her neck. What makes him so mad? Why is he always so angry? I ask. He's like a firework. And me and my mother are like little matches. And we say one unlikely word, and the firework is ignited, and it explodes. Like the other night, for example, I was sitting having dinner with Mum and Dad at the vintage green formica table in our kitchen. It's always so uncomfortable sitting down to dinner when Dad's there. My mother says to my dad, Do you want any more chicken casserole? He finished it all, you see. He only had a little piece of potato left on his plate. He said, If I want any more bloody chicken casserole, I will ask for it, woman. And then he picks up the plate and he throws it across the kitchen, smashing it into smithereens. 
so that it's lying shattered all over the kitchen floor. And our Labrador Rover, he races out of the kitchen so fast, he's so scared of Daddy, as Dad sometimes kicks him really hard, and he squeals in pain. He then spouts, Why does everyone in this house have the brain cells of a plant? Do you not see the potato on my plate, woman? I didn't eat it up, did I? My mother says, No, you didn't. There you are then, woman. Use your brains, girl. If I didn't eat the potato, it means I'm full. If I'm full, it means I don't want any more bloody chicken casserole. And while we're talking about your chicken casserole, it might be nice if you weren't such a lazy bugger and you put some dumplings in it from time to time. My mother always made dumplings for the family when she made chicken casserole and she's had many more mouths to feed than you've had. Needless to say, she was a far more superior cook than you are. Infinitely better. But that wouldn't be hard, would it? For a start, the food actually tasted good. I'll make you dumplings next time, I promise, my mother says. My father snorts, next time. You'll make me dumplings next time. Oh, isn't that really nice? Isn't that rich? It's always next time with you, isn't it? Always away in the future. You're a lazy bugger. You always have been. And then my horrible father, he grabs my mother by her hair. He pulls her really hard so she's crying out in pain because he pulls her hair really, really hard. And then he drags her to the doormat and my mother is crying and begging him to stop. She keeps saying, I'm sorry, I'll make you dumplings next time. I promise you, I'll make you dumplings. She blurts out, but of course, my father doesn't listen. He doesn't care. He's enjoying hurting my mother. He likes it when she's upset. He seems to get pleasure from it. I say to him, Daddy, please leave Mummy alone. Don't hurt her. I'm standing in front of my mother, trying to protect her. The next thing I know, he plunges a fist right into my eyes. How dare you interfere, Marty? This is between me and your mother. We're having a nice chat together. Now leave us alone. Go to your bedroom at once. Do you hear me, boy? It sounds like your dad's not right in the head, I say. I mean, why is he so volatile, so explosive? Why doesn't your mother leave him? We did try to escape once, but my father caught us, dashing into the truck. He locked us both into the closet for a whole week. He fed us dry bread and water. That's all we got. You're kidding. That's despicable. I'm sure if you told the sheriff, he could be arrested for cruelty. No, I'm not kidding about it at all. He did do that to us. Now you know why I want to kill him. Now you know why I hate him so much. One day he left his Winchester Model 70 rifle fully loaded on the patio. And I picked it up and I was longing to pull the trigger. I really was. I wanted to kill my dad. I didn't have the courage to do it. I'm a real wimp. But believe me, it would be an end to our misery. I was standing behind the door. My dad was sitting on the upholstered chair next to the fire. His head was bent over, reading the Louisville Courier. He had no idea I was there. My hand was on the trigger. It would be nothing to pull it back. And then he would be obliterated, gone from the face of the earth forever. And me and my mother... We'd be able to breathe again. We would be free. Living with him is like walking on eggshells every day. Me and my mother are too afraid to say anything, as it'll set him off. Marty pauses for a moment. I can't believe he's actually opening up to me like this. I sense he's relieved to let go of his angst that has been troubling him for a long time. Marty starts chewing a new blade of grass. The worst part of it all is if we say nothing at dinner, he then slams his fists on the table and says, Why is everyone so goddamn miserable in this house of ours? Why is no one talking? I'm sick of you two, always looking as if you're sulking. 
My mother will then say something like, Matty, why don't you tell us how your day was at school today? So I'll say something like, It was all right. The same as usual, really. I can't imagine eating dinner in such a tense environment all the time, I say. No wonder your mother looks so afraid. My dad's a big, big bully, says Marty. You know how many times I've dreamed of him just lying there dead. I've dreamt of him being eaten by a pack of coyotes or falling down a landmine. I even prayed to God once to take him away from us because he doesn't deserve to live. I know that that is a horrible thing to say about my own dad, but my dad makes everybody miserable. The dog, even his own family members who live far away from here, and me, and most of all he makes my mum very, very sad. I'm scared about going home tonight, he admits. Why? Because you know he'll be in a bad mood. Marty looks at me, his eyes growing round with fear. No, that's a given. He's always in a bad mood. It's just, I was playing with a ball this morning, he almost whispers. And I hit his gun cabinet. When my father, well, well he keeps his rifles there. And I shattered the glass. It looks like a huge spider web crack. I'm too scared to tell him I did it because I know how angry he's going to be. But when he sees it, he'll know it was me. And he'll give me such a beating. He loves that gun cabinet of his. So there we are. That's the end of part one. Because this is a long story, so it's divided into two parts. Because otherwise it takes a lot for them to process. When it takes over an hour, then it is quite long to process. So until next time, goodbye and good night. Tomorrow will be part two.